All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Lee Shea McDonough. How are you doing, Lee? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Lee is in North Carolina right now, so other side of the country. Or other side of the country, whichever. Um, and, what, and what we're going to talk about today is creating a sustainable coaching business. And Lee is the CEO and founder of Coach with Clarity, a training and education company for life and business coaches. Also the host of Coach with Clarity podcast and author of the number one best-selling uh, book, Act on Your Business, Braving the Storms of Entrepreneurship and Creating Success Through Meaning Mindset and mindfulness. Okay, so I'm delighted uh, that we're going to have talk about this subject today about about coaching because I'm a big be big believer in coaching, but um, life coaching as well as business uh, coaching. But still, Lee, there is still this thing around business coaching, right? Where I I say this all the time, so I'm I'm sorry for repeating myself for people who've heard it before, but I. We will invest so much money in our hobbies. We'll get coaches for our hobbies, but we won't get coaches and pay money for the thing that puts bread on our table. And I still don't really understand that. I'm not sure I do either, but I do think on some level, there is the assumption that we should just be good at what we do inherently and to seek support from someone else. I think once upon a time that may have been interpreted as a weakness. I do think though we're seeing a paradigm shift and we're now recognizing the fact that really strong business owners have a team of people to support them. And that team can, and in my opinion, should include a coach. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you on, on that. And I think it is, I think that is the, the, the thing that holds people back is that belief that I should be good enough or it's going to, as you said, it's going to show I'm, I'm weakness or I've got gaps. Uh, but the reality is, I mean, business is changing so much. And even the, I mean, look at it the last two years, there's probably people who, who never even contemplated working remotely are now like full-time working remotely. Now they have to, maybe they're running a team. Now they've got to understand how do I manage a remote team and all of these things. So it's such, it's, it's constantly changing that would, wouldn't it make sense to have that independent person, that coach to help you uh, and, and figure out where the gaps are and to help you through these changes? I think you're exactly right. I mean, one thing is for certain, and that is change. Regardless of what's going on, we're always going to be experiencing change. And to try to do so alone, well, that's a very isolating experience. And so when you can surround yourself with people that you trust, people who have your back, uh, and ideally that's what you'll find in, in a coach, uh, then that's gonna help you navigate the uncertainties that come when we're facing that kind of transition. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when you work with people, what makes a good coach? I mean, when you see like, first of all, uh, an example of somebody who's an existing coach, maybe you don't have to name them, but just traits. But also when you work with somebody and you see, okay, this person has, looks like they have the capabilities, because I think a lot of people don't understand what it takes to be a coach. And there may be a lot of people out there who would make fantastic coaches, but don't realize it. I suspect you're right. And I think think that there are qualities that can be honed in a coach to really make them go from, from a good coach to a great coach. One thing I always look for in the people that I train is their ability to balance the need to really focus your attention on your client and what they are communicating, both verbally and non-verbally. Balancing that with also listening to your own internal voice, trusting your hunches, and understanding how to balance that internal reflection with that external listening. Uh, because I do know some coaches who get so carried away with their own thoughts that they actually tune out what the client is saying. And then other coaches who are so focused on what the client's saying, they kind of don't pay attention to their own gut response. And so I think a good coach knows how to balance those two things. Yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. I think the other thing, too, is, to be honest, Lee, I don't think a lot of people understand what coaching actually means. I, I, I think a lot of people's concept of coaching is probably in this country, but certainly probably their high school coach, right? Lacrosse, basketball, volleyball, whatever. And that was probably their last experience of a coach. So they think a coach shouts at you and tells you what to do. 
I think you're right. And, you know, certainly in that setting, that is a very important part of coaching, talking about what you should do and, and really being instructed around what the, uh, what the ideal next step is. I think that when we're looking at the coaching we're talking about, whether it's life, business, relationship, you name it, I really view it more as a dynamic partnership that is client centered. So we're really putting the client's agenda, their, their needs and their desires first. And we're bringing in our expertise and our experience to support them as they define and explore and ideally embody whatever it is they want to be. And so as coaches, our job is not always to instruct or to tell someone what to do the way maybe it's done in athletic coaching, but it's really more of a partnership that allows the client to explore these things on their own. We're asking the right questions. We're providing the right insights in order to further the client's own understanding, because ideally they're going to come up with their own solutions. It's not us telling them what to do. It's more like together we're uncovering maybe what was already in there all along. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see as you know, the, one of the rules of, uh, uh, immutable rules of communication is that people believe conclusions they arrive at by themselves over anything you can ever tell them. So, you know, part of your coaching job is to help help guide them on that journey to 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 reaching the conclusions that they need to reach. That's exactly right. And and so there is a bit of a dance that we coaches do between honoring what the client is bringing forth and their ideas coupled with our own knowledge, wisdom, experience and knowing when and how to bring that up in a way that serves the client. And that is a balance that that definitely takes some skill and some practice. And then, I mean, I, I guess also you have uh, people who have got the characteristics of the traits and you think they will be good and all of that, but they probably are thinking, OK, but, but are people really going to pay me to do this? I mean, how do you help people get over that kind of imposter syndrome? Well, I mean, that's a question that I think every single coach faces at least one point in their career, if not every day in their career. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is there will be people who are skeptical of coaching and who have some reservations. I don't view it as my job to convince or convert anyone. It's merely me sharing what I do and also reflecting some of the results that I've been able to achieve in partnership with past clients and simply providing the information so that my potential client can make their decision. The other thing too, and, and I hope this doesn't sound manipulative, I don't mean it to be, but sometimes potential clients need to have the experience of trying to do something on their own and realize how difficult it is, how much time it takes, and the fact that it's typically not much fun. So mm -hmm. they have that experience, then they come to us and we can say, you can continue to do that, absolutely. And you probably will get what you want eventually. But working in partnership, we might be able to achieve that more efficiently, more effectively, and certainly with more fun. And so that's how I frame it, not necessarily an either or, but more about where are you in your particular journey? And at what point are you really ready to pursue coaching? And I don't rush people. I know they'll come to it in their own time. And I'm here when they're ready. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Because I mean, if you're not ready for something like that, you could crash and burn. It, quite easily and it could be quite a uh, well it could be quite a damaging experience if you're not ready and uh, you know things things go south when you start to try and try and coach some people um but as we sort of mentioned at the beginning do you think the tide is turning now on on business coaching because as i said i mean it's such a complex world to navigate and we're so scattered in our thinking right now because we've got so many distractions we've got our phones jumping up and down we've got all this stuff going on that it's getting harder i think it's getting harder and harder for people to to find focus and clarity no, I think you're right. I think we're seeing a, a sea change. Just in the last even five years, I've noticed that coaching has really become more of, uh, it's, it's in the zeitgeist. We're talking about it. And I think it's not just coaching. I think we're really looking at mental fitness. And in fact, I was listening to an episode of yours from a few weeks ago around neuroleadership and mental fitness. And I was just thinking to myself, this is it. This is what people want. And now we are framing it in such a way where people realize, oh, I can get this within the context of my business or my career. Before I became a coach and before I started training coaches, I was a therapist for over 15 years. And so 
so a lot of these issues I would see in the therapy room, but it was around more mental health disorders. Now I think what we're seeing is a way to support people in their work, in their relationships, in their lives. And it doesn't necessarily require a diagnosis. It doesn't require uh, pathologizing behavior. It's more about you're doing okay. How can we help you optimize your performance? And we can use a lot of the same tools and techniques, but in a very different application. And now I think we're really starting to see more general acceptance of that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because uh, it is one of the one of the things that I do like to talk about sometimes, though, is I, I think we, we've moved or hopefully we've started to move beyond this idea of where everything is so compartmentalized. It's like, you know, I've got a pain in my side. I go to the doctor, right? Physical doctor. I'm not feeling great about life. I go to a, you know, a, a mental you know, health expert but we never connect the two, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in work. It's like, um, you know, you have all this stuff going on and, and we never make the connections between um, mental health or mental fitness and your ability to, to do your job. We've kept all of those things, maybe a little taboo even. I think you're right. I think on some level, at some point, we have divided the body from the mind, from the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when we bring all of those back together in harmony, then we're really able to operate at our fullest potential. Yeah, no, I absolutely think so. And I think that is one of the lessons coming out of all of this, because I think if they're not, if organizations or individuals aren't worrying, aren't paying attention to mental fitness as well as physical fitness, you know, I think uh, it, it's it's going to be a long road ahead, ahead for some people. Um, so what are some examples, um, as I said, you don't have to name them, but some examples you have of, of coaches that are just fantastic and have made a great impact and what makes them so good? I want to talk about impact because I, I think that's really at the heart of it. Yep. And, you know, I, I've certainly worked with some coaches and some clients who feel like in order to make an impact, they have to impact millions. And actually, I take a very different view. I, I would much rather look at the ripple effect and having significant impact in the life of a single client or in a few clients and then watching how that expands so that it in turn impacts their work, their colleagues, their partners and spouses and kids. I mean, that is having a true impact. And so I think effective coaches know that it's, we can have a great impact on the masses by focusing on the few. And that's really the, the approach I take in my work. And it's why I'm very happy being a small but mighty coach training company, because I really want to focus my time on those select few, because I know that they're going to have a significant impact uh, over the long haul. Yeah, no, I, and I, I would totally agree with you. I mean, I, I say that uh, myself a lot of the time is that if people focused on themselves uh, on just being the best person they could be, being the best you know, spouse, being the best parent, being the best uh, you know, neighbor, community, whatever, the effect of that is far beyond sitting in your backyard with the beer, tweeting out about global issues, you know, or arguing, you know, over a barbecue about stuff that you have no impact on. <laughs> I, th I think you're exactly right. And I think for, for me, it really comes down to knowing what matters most to you. And, and that's the meaning part. When I talk about meaning, mindset, and mindfulness, meaning is really about being clear on your values. What drives you? What gives your life a sense of purpose? You know, what, what's your legacy? What do you want to be known for? And I think when we can anchor our work in that deeper purpose, and then when our actions are consistent with those values and, and with our purpose, that's where we experience contentment. Uh, and that's, to me, that's, that's the definition of fulfillment. Yeah, no, I, I have to agree, because uh, even going back to my first experience using a coach, it was the first time I, I got my first ever executive level job. And I thought, oh, I'm on the executive team now. I'm kind of, <laughs> I better get some help. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to your point, though, I thought I was hiring a coach who would just kind of help me be really good at the job and like present myself and all of that. But my coach came in and certainly she helped with that. But more to your point, she was more about, OK, but what you really want to do, why do you really want to do it? And is this is this the pinnacle of what you want to do? And it turned out, of course, it wasn't. And she said, OK, well, let's focus on getting you to the place where you really want to be. 
what a fabulous coach you had. It sounds like she really knew how to, how to hone in on that. And it's, it's interesting because when I think about my own experience with clients, a lot of times when they come to me, it's tell me how to do this. They want the how to, so I'm all about centering their agenda. We're going to start with the how to. And then after a couple sessions, it's interesting how it's like, oh, but wait, there's more. And then we go deeper. Then we start exploring the the mission-driven ideas, the purpose. We start diving into mindset issues. Then we do some of that deeper work. And once we've been able to do that, then we can reemerge and address all of the how-tos, but from a very different vantage point. And it's just interesting to me to watch the evolution of a coaching relationship. And I think some of that comes with time because we do need to build trust and build rapport. And as we become more comfortable with our coach, that's when all of a sudden we can do that, that deeper work. Um, and I love doing that kind of work, but I also recognize sometimes we gotta, we gotta take a little time with that. We gotta warm up into it. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're totally right. I think with anything, you've got to show a couple of little sort of steps, baby steps, a few little successes, as you said, to, to build that, to build that level of, of trust. Um, and so, do you, uh, have you come across organize? Have you come across where organizations are maybe uh, funding a little more of this? Because this is something that was is traditionally kind of people do on their own, right? They hire their own coaches. Are you coming across any instances where you see businesses actually uh, realizing the benefit of this and maybe making an offering of this kind of coaching to their employees? I have, especially over the last few years, when we're looking at the great resignation, we're looking at employees having quite a lot of power and companies are realizing that it benefits them in the long run to support their people. And coaching is one way to do that. And so, yes, I am seeing quite a number of organizations offering to reimburse either partially or fully an employee's coaching expenses. We're seeing it a lot in, in law. I know a lot of um, attorneys who are able to get their firms to pay for it, but I'm seeing it in other professional organizations as well. And I think that's definitely something employees can consider when they're weighing, do I stay, do I leave? And, and how can I ask my current employer to support me so that I can perform better for them? Yeah, and I, and I think uh, th that's just a great point you made there that I just want to double underline is having that conversation with your employer about how can you support me to, you know, be the best I can be to make the biggest contribution to the organization. I think sometimes people are reluctant to have that conversation. That's understandable because on some level we are making an ask. But that ask, the, the result of that is going to benefit everyone involved. And I think that's where if an employee does want to pursue coaching and they do want their employer to reimburse them for it, we need to make the argument about how this is not just a me benefit, but it's a we benefit. And I think to their credit, employers are really seeing that more. And so now oftentimes it's becoming a part of that compensation package, uh, which just delights me to no end because I really believe in the power of coaching to build better futures and a better world for everyone. And so I, th I think we're really seeing a shift uh, in, in the executive corporate and professional sphere around how coaching is, is valued. Yeah, no, and especially as I said, when we have virtual and hybrid organizations now and such a distributed workforce, not just distributed geographically even, you know, and across many different cultures and whatever, I think that it, it, the only way you're gonna get optimal performance out of your best people is if you, Give, provide them with some help because we as i said earlier we live in such a, a crazy world and and a very um uh, a very mobile world too so people can switch around very quickly you're right and and we don't exist in vacuums you know it's not like we shut off the rest of our life when we go to work mm -hmm. and most of us don't shut off our work when we go home either we can have a whole conversation about <laughs> boundaries and, and the like that we'll say that for another episode yeah, but yeah. i i think people are starting to realize that we are holistic beings and so if we can support our employees in their workspace it's going to make them stronger more resilient it's certainly going to benefit the organization but it's going to benefit the individual too and so this is really a case where everyone wins no, yeah, absolutely. And I think it is. So, um, so somebody who, again, who's considering the coaching business, what, give me the, what are the hardest parts of it? Because that's always what people want to know. 
Yes. Well, I think it really depends on your path into coaching. Uh, if you are an internal coach, say you're a coach who works for a company or an organization, I would say the most difficult part is probably creating and maintaining boundaries around the work you do and the relationships you have and the expectations that uh, supervisors, managers, and the like may have. And so being really clear around uh, limits of privacy, confidentiality, what's expected, that's going to be particularly important for internal coaches. Now for yeah. external coaches. No, I was just going to say for the, go for the, yeah, no, no, just the internal coaches. It's just interesting. Yeah. Because it, it could be, you could quite easily end up like being a little bit kind of abused by the other managers. Say, oh, oh, the coach can solve that. The coach can solve that. <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. And that puts the coach in the position of problem solver, which mm -hmm. many coaches are great at solving problems, but that's not really what we do. Really, we're more solution oriented. And ideally, those solutions are going to come from the client. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's about communicating and maintaining boundaries, which honestly is something every coach needs to do, regardless of whether they're internal or external. Um, I would say though, for external coaches, say the coaches who go into business for themselves, who, who are small business owners, the tricky part is balancing working in your business and working on your business. Most coaches I know go into coaching because they want to coach and they're very comfortable working in their business with their clients. But when it comes to marketing, sales and the like, that's where it can feel really overwhelming. And so I would say to any coach who's thinking of going into business for themselves, remember that you have the skills you need to do this because marketing and sales is about building relationships. Yep. That's what we do at co as coaches. We're experts at that. And so it's really more thinking about how can you take your existing skill set and apply it to this new task, not, oh my gosh, I don't know how to market and sell myself, but it's no, how do I build relationships that will ultimately build my business? Yeah. And that's one thing I just wanted to come back to uh, what you mentioned there is the, the boundaries piece, because I'd say that's obviously a very critical piece of coaching is, uh, you know, setting proper boundaries, because I could see mm. it's very easy, especially if you develop a relationship with somebody over time, it's very easy for all the lines to get blurred. Yes, it is. And so I think to the extent possible, if you can start as you mean to go on, uh, that will really help ensure that the relationship stays in a professional, friendly, even collegial uh, capacity. But for example, my preference when I'm working with my clients is I have a particular app that I use for our between session communication. I will use that app in lieu of giving them my personal cell phone. So that way I know that my texts are personal, it's for family, it's for friends, whereas this app, this is for my clients. It's a very simple delineation for me, but it also kind of creates that separation that I need in order to really effectively do my job. And so when we inform our clients of that from the beginning, then there's no surprises. And so whether it's in your written contract, whether it's something that you speak about in, in your first session, even before your first session, being really clear about what your client can expect from you and when, and then giving them proper channels to communicate with you goes a long way towards maintaining those boundaries. Yeah, and, and probably pointing out that you're their coach and not their therapist. That's helpful too. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Lee, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Lee's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Lee, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Well, thank you. I have so enjoyed our conversation. I would love to connect further. You can learn more about the work I do at coachwithclarity.com. And you can also find me on Instagram at coachwithclarity. Perfect. Well, listen, thanks again, Lee. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.